This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. Today on the show, I have Ryan Holiday. Ryan is an American author, writer, and marketer. He's the media strategist behind authors Tucker Max and Robert Green. He's also the editor at large for the New York Observer. This is Ryan's third appearance on my show, I believe. We go in today to one topic near and dear to both of us writing, particularly writing a book, a process. There is a process behind. Not only writing a book, but having a great book that people read, that gets purchased by people, that might even become a bestseller. There's a process behind this. Ryan had a great post on his blog that I saw, and I thought, wow, we could just take this post apart as an entire podcast episode. What's also interesting about our conversation today, I don't think you can do this completely, But let's say you have no interest in writing, no interest in publishing a book, zero. I have a sneaky suspicion you will get a lot from this episode if you simply substitute the word writing for whatever you are interested in. That won't work exactly in 100% fashion. But no doubt, much of our conversation today, while very specifically about writing a book, applies to life. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Ryan Holiday. Hey, Ryan, how are you? Doing very well. How are you? Not too bad. Let me tell you how I came to find you today. So a young guy that I know, he's in his 20s, he's working on his first book, and I had read the manuscript, and I... And this isn't to pick on him or anything, but I, it was kind of a, a take on how jobs are kind of going by the way of the dinosaur and take care of yourself, be an entrepreneur, all that kind of fun stuff. But you know, his big picture theme, his main thing, wasn't even at the standard of a Seth Godin or a James Altucher. And then I saw your piece about writing, you know, three books in three years, having something to say. And I said, ah. Plus, plus everything you write, I, I always go, I always go, damn, I kind of lived part of this, but he's saying it better and giving me instruction on how I can do it better than I've already done five books. So that's why I wanted to talk today. Awesome. Yeah, let's do it. It's funny. No, the, the reason I wanted to jump on this too is I'm actually doing a book on book marketing for Penguin that I haven't started thinking about yet. So hopefully this will be a, <laughs> will be a step in the right direction well, for me. Like you, you know, like you say, it's a, it's a tough slog. I mean, it's not easy doing a book and there's a lot of crappy advice out there. Totally. The best place to start literally is perhaps even where you start, which is which, I mean, I look at my, my Mac, it's just folders and folders and I haven't even got to the good note card system yet, but to always be researching and I'm always clipping, I'm always filing something, finding something, saving something. I've been doing this for like 15 years. Talk about the idea of always researching. So I think what's interesting is that people think writing a book is like putting words down and that's certainly part of it. But if you don't know what it is that you are, you are actually trying to say, and you don't have the source material to be able to back up what you're saying, I find that you end up droning on and on and you don't, you don't make your points in a compelling way. Like I was talking to this author recently who told me he'd written 150,000 words for a book that was supposed to be 60,000 words. And he just figured out what the book was going to be after writing that. And so obviously like my heart breaks for this person because since he hadn't researched properly, since he hadn't, his life hadn't been an accumulation of ideas or potential resources or examples or stories that he would use in the book. He was just sort of making it up as he goes along. And as a result, he ends up doing way more work than he actually needs to, to do. And I think, you know, if, if you're sitting down, let's say you, you have a book contract for yourself publishing a book. That, that process might be a year, right? You know, that from the idea to the published book, that might be a year. Well, that's great. But if you want a book that really lasts, it should be the accumulation of 
of years or decades of knowledge. And so I'm always researching for like potential book ideas. Um, I'm collecting stories or anecdotes that might work for an idea I might have for a book. And these things are very flexible, but I'm accumulating lots and lots of material that I can winnow down for a book rather than trying to find it on the fly. Do you think your associate was burdened by the, the, the fantasy that you must compose every word yourself. Whereas, look, a lot of people have come before us, clearly, and I look at your your influences go back a couple thousand years. So I think a lot of people have a hard time with the idea of taking other people's pearls of wisdom, their thoughts, and bringing that forward to a next level. They seem to, so many people seem to want to invent this out of whole cloth. Yeah, you know what? I think that's a big part of it. And then the other big part of it is I think we have these sort of, we have this drama narrative around what a writer is supposed to be and look like. You know, there's that Hemingway quote where like, you know, a writer sits down at their typewriter and bleeds. And so people think that writing is this sort of sexy, emotional thing. And it, it can be, but it's also a lot of work and it's also the art of persuasion and rhetoric and all these things that take a lot of skill. I think people are so caught up on the passionate side of things or the, the fun parts that they don't do the work. They don't, they don't do, they don't, they don't do the equation that you were just doing there, which is think about whether the best way to convince someone of what you're trying to, to convince them of is to marshal you know, anecdotes and stories from history or from research, or it's to tell them, you know, a story that you made up off the top of your head. It's it's really about sitting there and thinking, what's the best way to sell what I'm trying to sell? And, and, and by that, I mean, like, sell it to the reader who needs to believe it. What's the best way to do that and be willing to put in the work to make that happen? I look at the author of the Harry Potter books. She's so good that you think she just started on word one and never stopped till the end. But that's not, yeah, her, totally. that's not her process. Her process is, is chunking things and then uh, putting it all together so it's seamless and, and it fools the audience, but that's not really what she did to get there. Yeah, and, and like people think this is like, and I, I definitely think this is much more seductive in, in the sort of fiction space, particularly fantasy. It's like, oh, she's just got this great imagination. She's pulling this out of her, you know, out of her mind. It's so beautiful. She has a degree in the classics, right? Like this is based, it, this is fictionalized, but she's using stories and plot lines from, from the greats and then reimagining them. It's, it's not that she is a creative genius that's pulling this out of thin air. She has a, a foundation that she's building on. And I think all writers need to do that. Yeah, let's talk about one of the se the second point. You kind of already touched on it, but like to know where you're going and have a plan. And I mean, I could think back to my second book. I literally was, it was so easy because I had done so many years of research. I was like, oh, I know what the 12 chapter is going to be. Boom, 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 boom. And it just filled right in. Totally. Yeah. Like, so with my, my book on stoicism, people are like, oh, how long did it take you to write this? And it's like about three months. Um, which is a very short amount of time, except for I was researching and organizing and planning the book for seven years. So the, the writing is the easy part in my eyes. It's the having the plan. It's creating the outline. It's, it's, you know, marshalling the, 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 the set pieces that you're going to use for the book that, that the hard work is done. And so, you know, one of the things I see with people who self publish, it, that's that's a disadvantage is that at least when you're traditionally publishing, you have to create a proposal and you have to fully sketch out the book from beginning to end to get someone to give you money to go make that book. And, th and anyone who's ever traditionally published knows how difficult this is to be able to convincingly argue and, and speak about a book that you haven't written forces you to imagine all the different pieces that are going to go into it. And that's what I, that's why the plan is so important. And, and I don't start writing until I have this plan and I have these things sketched out. So I'm not blindly going down alleys and I'm not going off on these tangents that, that I don't end up being able to use. Look, if you've got the, if you've got the research, 
then you have the depth and you are so 100% accurate. And I think that's why I look at my stage. I look at your writing and I look at this, this particular piece and I love it because you're saying writing is the easy part. And there's surely people that are going to hear you say that and go, oh, yeah, whatever. Da, da, da. You are 100% accurate. The hard part is finding all the nuggets, the morsels, the pieces, the connective tissue. They're going to go into it. Once you have all that, you can sit down and like you said, 90 days you did your book. Right. And, and look, it's not that writing is easy, but it's easy compared to figuring out what you want to have to say. It's like, think about it. If you were forced to just fill up lots of pages, you would just ramble on and ramble on. Like r putting down words is not difficult, but the right words in the right way, saying the right things, you know, to, to paraphrase Aristotle, that's, that's the hard part. And that's what separates a decent book from a really amazing sort of perennial selling book. Hey, talk about the idea of using everything as fuel, life experiences, whatever happened that day, and how it all comes in. And as your mentor said to you, it's all material. Talk about this notion of all material. What do you, what do you mean by that? Yeah, so that came from Robert Greene, who people don't know. Robert Greene, he wrote The 48 Laws of Power. He wrote his first book, which has now sold like 2 million copies. He wrote it when he was like in his 40s, his early 40s. So you would think like, oh, did he just waste the first 40 years of his life not being the writer that he needed to become? And it's like, no, those experiences, having dead end jobs, working in Hollywood, doing these things, that those were the experiences that fueled and underlie the anecdotes and stories in The 48 Laws of Power. And so I, I think about this too, and I think it goes back to the first point about research, which is everything that you're experiencing should be sublimated and transferred into the work that you're doing. And that's how a work feels personal. You want the reader to feel like this really spoke to me, but you don't want to have to, you know, we're not trying to, you know, to to hit it on the nose here every time. You, you want this book to feel natural and personal and, and real. And you do that by going through your experience. So I'm working on a book right now and then I'm, you know, dealing with some stuff in my private life. I'm not saying here's what I'm dealing with in my private life. I'm trying to take those experiences that I'm having right now, universalize them, and then put them into the work in a subtle way. And, and in a weird way, this makes the difficulty that I'm going through have some meaning or purpose because it's like, it was really shitty and I wish that that hadn't happened. But at the same time, this super powerful paragraph on page 27 came directly from that unpleasantness, at least I got something from it. I have a feeling that we both have a similar problem that probably drives some people nuts, and that is the constant observation. I, I always observe myself, I observe everything around, yeah. and there's lessons and anecdotes everywhere, every day, every minute, and it's up to you to look at it, observe, take note, memorize it, write it down, and save it, and utilize it at some point in time in your life, perhaps if you have a book goal. Yeah, and, and look, one of my sort of twists on that is, I try to write on a pretty regular weekly basis as well online. And I'm trying to talk about these experiences as they're happening. And then the ones that do really well, that clearly resonate with people, I make another note and then I think about whether that needs to be transferred or elaborated on in a book form. So I'm always, it's not only everything that happens to you is material, but some material is better than other material. And if you test it, you can find out what gets the best response, and that's how you know that you've struck a nerve or maybe discovered a market. Before I go to number four in this particular blog post of yours that we're talking about, everybody should check it out. It's called The Strategies That Helped Me Write Three Books in Three Years. I want to go to one quick note, though, from an, another blog post of yours, and you are referencing a tip that you got from Tucker Max. Mm -hmm. uh, about listening to the same song over and over again. Now I'm just talking about the pure act of writing, sitting down sure. at the computer. Talk about the idea of listening to the same song over and over again. Yeah, so obviously, you know, whatever was going to work for different people is going to work for different people. But personally, I find that the way that I sort of pull writing out of myself is to get in this place where my sort of subconscious is 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 activated by the zone. Yeah. Yeah. Or a flow state or whatever you want to call it. And I tend to find this by like, I, I listen to very weird kinds of music 
I'm usually like sort of very like hook centric songs and I listen to them over and over and over again. Like I, I'm trying to pull up my computer. This, uh, this song that I've been listening to as of this morning has 189 plays and I probably bought it like two days ago. So I listen to it a bunch of times. I totally tune out. And then by tuning out, I'm getting connected with something inside myself that lets me pull the writing out. Now it's, it's not like, Oh, I'm just, inspired and this is magically coming to me i'm i'm using the note cards i'm using the research that i've done but i'm also getting in a place where there's very little else that i'm thinking about or focusing on or being distracted by yeah and that's the ultimate word distraction it's almost impossible to write a book if you've got distraction oh totally and because uh, and this sort of goes into what i'm sure we're going to talk about next but like writing a book is very unpleasant right there's a saying um writers like or sorry painters like painting writers like having written and so because it can be unpleasant and it's so much work you will i promise you you will indulge in just about every distraction that you could conceivably justify you've got to find these pockets where you're really productive to counteract all the unproductiveness that you're likely going to engage in you know you mentioned the flow state and I remember talking to your author, Stephen Kotler, too. But what's really amazing, when you get into the flow state, and I'm sure you can, you're going to pass along the same experience, you can lose, and, and people listening might think this is crazy, you can lose 10, 12, 14 hours, and all of a sudden you go, it went from day to night, you have no idea what time it is, and you look at the clock and you go, you've got to be kidding me, I just lost 12 hours doing that, and you have no perception of time at all. Yeah, I think that's it. And then I think the the flip side of that is, you think you were writing for like three hours and it was like 45 minutes, but you were so productive that you got that much work done. And so I, I tend to experience the latter one more than the former, but yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a very powerful feeling and sensation. And you feel it, I think in different layers or degrees, it doesn't always happen the way you want it to happen, but That's where your big breakthroughs happen, certainly. You know, I mentioned the young guy in the very beginning of this conversation, and I think it comes back to number four on your list, which is really tough for people today because everybody wants to have everyone be their friend. Everyone wants to be liked. No one wants to go out on a ledge. No one wants to go on a limb. Have something to say. And if you don't have anything to say, maybe you shouldn't write a book. Yeah, well, that's the thing is everyone wants to write a book. And more importantly, a lot of people, especially in our space, think that they need to have a book. And that's what's dictating their decision, not this overwhelming thing that they they feel compelled to produce. And so it's like, like the question is, why are you writing this book? Should The answer should be because I can't not write it, mm. not because I think it's going to do well or whatever, right? Like, it, I, I quote George Orwell, it's like, look, a, a book is like this exhausting, horrible struggle. I think he compares it to like a painful, a painful illness. And so if you're not driven by like a demon or some overwhelming need to produce this thing, you're not going to have what it takes to either get through the process or go to the place that you need to go to to produce the material that you need to produce. And yeah, writing is not easy. It, it, it's, it can be a slog. Producing a book is, here's, here's what I, what I tell people about books. A book is, let's say it's 60, 70,000 words, right? Nonfiction, fiction's more. That means that every day that you sit down and write. So you sit down and you have a productive day writing. Let's say you produce a thousand words, a thousand usable words. That means you've made essentially no visible progress towards your goal. So you you wake up and you work a full day on something and you can't see that you are any closer to being at the end of that process. It's this it can be this very demoralizing process because you're working but it, you don't you don't feel like you have any momentum until you're so far down like Like, I'm just seeing the light at the end of the tunnel of the book that I'm working on now. And so now I feel really good. But two months ago, it was like, is this even a book? Where is this going? Should I just quit? What am I thinking? And so if you don't feel like you have to do this, that you have to communicate to the world this thing that you're deeply, that you deeply believe in, you're gonna, you can, it will become very easy to find an excuse to quit. 
There's got to be some kind of uh, uh, almost like profit like zeal that you want to be at the top of the mountain you're not yep. play, you're not playing it safe anymore you've, you've determined uh, you know i am going to be very direct some people aren't going to like me and, and you've i think you've got to be at that point i mean not everyone's going to like everything you say but you've got to speak the truth as you know it yeah and and that that is what motivates you to sit down and work for five hours and not make progress because you don't care about that. You care about getting it out. Like you feel like you have to get this weight off your chest and that's what motivates you. Your fifth point was the idea of making commitments. And I think primarily you're talking about from the idea of working with a traditional publisher, doing a contract and having deadlines. I can wholly agree that that is spot on. I think for any type of a, a, a new author, I think it's spot on. The only disagreement I might have is I start to feel this in my own self right now is I, I, I don't want to give away as much to the publishers now, but I, I would think for a, for a new author, I think beyond a shadow of a doubt, that deadline, when, when you sign this contract with a big old publisher and you've got to deliver it by this deadline and, and you know, that's, there's money attached to it. Uh, you do it. Yeah, sure. Well, look, and, and that's actually something I see with self-publishing that's very hard. It's like, because everything is in your control, you can rationalize why you're missing deadlines. So it's not that, that traditional publishing is the, is what you should do instead. It's just like, you've got to compensate for that. So it's like, you know, I'll talk to a self-published author. They'll try to hire my company. And I'll be like, when's your book coming out? And they're like, oh, I think maybe July or something like that. And it's like, no, 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 no. You need to pick a date and that needs to be a drop dead deadline and you need to essentially kill yourself to get there. And if you can't, I promise you, you will end up moving that deadline or putting things off until the last minute. And so uh, an, another way to do this that I do with my books is I break my books up into very small sections and I work on those sections. So I do feel like there is some illusion of progress, right? So my last book was three parts and each part had 10 chapters in those parts. I'm waking up this week and I'm working on part two, chapter six, and that might be two days work. And I'm able to measure myself against these internal deadlines, which also have an external deadline. And if you can't do that, it can become very easy to get lost in the weeds or to put things off or, you know, to to become a perfectionist and these commitments can help you get over that distraction or that rationalization. And I think the perfectionism is part of the process too. You have to, I remember my first book, I'd be so excited to get to the, like to the second printing so I could fix every damn error that I had found. You, you didn't want to, you didn't want to leave that stuff out there. And I'm sure some people don't care, but you know, what's the ultimate goal? If you're going to put a book out, your goal is to hopefully to reach as many people as possible. Yeah, money's nice, but you want to spread the message of all this hard work that you've done and, and, this gets kind of into the next part of the process I want to talk about with you, which is when you're doing a book, even if you're working with a traditional publisher, you've got to work with great people. One of the things that's interesting in your post is you talk about hiring. And now most people, if they know something about publishing, or maybe if they don't, if they've even heard stories, publishers have editors and publishers help you with uh, cover design. Oh my gosh. If you are depending on a publisher for your editing and your cover design, trouble. Yeah, look, I, I've done now, I have five books with the same publisher. And so I love them, clearly. I keep going back to them. But all the, the important services that I work on or that, that I think are critical to the outcome of the book, I also subsidize by paying out of my own pocket or working with the publisher to get them to bring on these experts. Because, look, a, a publisher publishes dozens of books a year, uh, sometimes hundreds of books a year. Only a few of those books at the, the very top of their list get the full sort of backing of the company. And if you want to have an amazing cover and you want to, you want to be a perfectionist about your cover, working with the salary designer at your publisher is only going to give you so much because they can only do, they can only give so much time to you. It's like, it's like, look, if you wanted your kid to be great at school, yes, you would put them in a great, you would put them in a great, a, a great school, but then you would also hire tutors and coaches to help them as well. And that's what I think about these professionals. So it's about 
finding the best publisher, or, you know, deciding you're going to invest in self-publishing, but then also saying, look, the way my book looks is important. The way it's edited is critical. That you know, the way it's marketed is is going to be the single most important way that it gets in front of the public. And I'm going to pay, whether out of my own pocket or, or not, or out of my advance or whatever, I'm going to pay to make sure those people are on my team because this book isn't going to become successful by accident. I had the idea, even on my first book, I wanted to do my own cover. I, I saw some of the early editions that the publisher was putting out, and it was just, they were terrible. So I immediately went to hire a designer, and I brought back some some other designs and stuff, but there was a real go round. And I'm curious, how did you approach getting the publisher to use your design? Did you walk in right from the beginning and say, I've got this great design. So they, they didn't even want to think about it because they liked your design so much. No, not at all. So even though I'd actually written in my proposal that I wanted to use this particular designer and, you know, they were like, Oh, sure. And then they, you know, they went and did their designs. This is for my first book, which probably has the most iconic of my covers. This is for Trust Me, I'm Lying. You know, their covers were, I don't want to throw this person on the bus, but they were just not good. Like, I would not sign my name to any of those covers. That was a bus. You, the other, they're under the bus, and there's skid marks across their back right now. Uh, and go yeah, ahead. Yeah, <laughs> I, I would just never, I would never publish, I would not put my name on the cover of that book. So I I worked with this designer, and and the designer came up with what I thought was this amazing cover and the publisher hated it. Like they just hated it. They were like, this is, this is awful. We'll never use this. No. And I fought for it and I fought for it. And we, we, I, I would improve it based on their feedback, but I was not willing to compromise on the core idea. And I believe what ended up happening is the publisher of Penguin, like the, the head publisher of Penguin ended up seeing a picture of it at a conference and she was like that's one of the greatest covers that i've ever seen who did that <laughs> and then the publisher was like oh it's this designer we're working with we just approved it and we ended up um we ended up compromising and like the reality is yes it's gonna be a fight it's gonna be people are always gonna be resistant to outsourced work or mm. you know work that steps on their toes that might be you know, a, a, a somewhat of a critique of their capabilities. And you've got to be really sensitive about that. And you have to be willing to collaborate and compromise. But at the end of the day, publishers are in the business of trying to sell lots of books. And if you bring the best cover to the table, um, and you can, you can back that with data. I, you know, I tested the covers to, to see what smart people thought was best and mine ended up winning out. Ryan, the last point in your post, which I love, and I think about it all the time, because I, I hear these words in my life, you know, people will say, what's your job? Or, you know, what do you do for work? As you talk about point number seven, you're linking it all together. There's no separation between work and life. It's all one big mishmash. Yeah. I don't, I don't know how many people out there that, that so-called go to work or have a job are ever going to truly understand that. But hey, I understand what you're saying. I mean, look, writing is not a job and it's not work. It's like a calling. It's something you do. Like I, there, there's uh, Edmund Wilson. He's this was this famous writer in the, the 20th century. He got in trouble with his taxes because he basically wrote every single thing off that he ever did. And he was like, look, I'm a writer. Everything I do is, is about my business. <laughs> and he ended up, you know, getting in lots of trouble. But I think I actually agree with his point. It, I'm sure you see this too. It's, it's next to impossible to distinguish when you are being a writer and when you are not being a writer once this becomes your occupation. Because every thing that you think, every place that you go, every person that you meet, every meal that you eat has some eventual connection to you sitting down at the computer and producing words. So true. So true. Yeah, and, and look, it's a really good thing. It's also it can make relationships hard, but it's it's a it's it's a fact, and you've got to embrace that, and you've got to start seeing. You know, this isn't this isn't a pastime. This isn't like a seminar that you do. This is this is your life, and if you want to be really good at it, you've got to be willing to make that sacrifice. Hey, I'm about ready to lose you here. Is there anything in particular that we've not talked about that you would love just to offer a, another pearl of wisdom on top of this conversation? Anything else that I've that I've missed that you think is important that people should think about? I, so I have another post called like six reasons your book will fail that I think people might want to look at. But the, the big thing is 
You need to sit down and figure out what your goals with your book are. Is it to sell a lot of copies? Is it that you want to be on the bestseller list? Is it that you want to make a lot of money? You know, what is it that you want out of this process? And you need to know what not only what you want, but what you don't want and you don't care about so you can prioritize accordingly. And that's probably good advice for life as a whole, too. Yeah, I think I think a, a lot of these posts, you could almost take out some of the, the references to writing and whatnot and look at them as life advice. And it still works. I think sure. that's, you know, I think there was that great book by Brenda Yulin back in the early 20th century, if you want to write. And she said, look, take out the word writing and anything else could fit in there and it works. That's awesome. I've never heard of that book. I'm going to get it. If you want to write. If you want to write by Brenda Yulin. Awesome. Uh, U-E-L-A-N-D. That sounds fantastic. Yeah, cool stuff. Hey, listen, where can we send people, Ryan? RyanHoliday.net. You're easy to find, even if you didn't give me a URL. If they, if they can't find you, they don't deserve to find any pearls of wisdom sure. from you. This so. is what Google is for. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Ryan, hopefully we can always keep chatting. I love talking to you. Of course. This was awesome. Thanks, man. Thanks. Take care. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.